All right, this is Tyler Baker, pastor here in Jacksonville, Florida, and this is going to be episode five for the Contend for the Faith uh, podcast, and I have a return guest. This is the first time uh, since the start of the podcast that I've had a guest come back, and this is going to be Bruce Gore again, Brother Bruce Gore, and I had a lot of people reach out to me that they very much uh, enjoyed the uh, the first podcast and episode that I did with uh, Brother Gore. And really, I'm, I'm more excited about this uh, episode than I was the first. And the reason is because the whole purpose that I reached out to uh, Bruce was to talk about postmillennialism. And that is going to be uh, the subject of tonight. So, uh, Brother Gore, um, I'm going to assume that everybody knows who you are, generally speaking, but if you just kind of want to give a very brief introduction for yourself, and if they want to know um, maybe some more details and, and a longer sure. testimony, they can go back to that first episode. All right. Well, I'm a long-term uh, uh, resident here of Spokane, Washington. I grew up about 100 miles from here, went to Whitworth University, uh, have uh, practice law over the years, uh, taught in various settings, including out at Whitworth as an adjunct faculty member. Uh, Retired at this point, uh, attend First Presbyterian Church Spokane, have uh, been uploading stuff to uh, YouTube and to Rumble and have been very pleased and surprised at the warm reception that uh, the material gets. So that's the short version of who I am. So it's an yes, honor to yes, be with sir. you again, Tyler. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, th- thank you for coming. Yeah. So I mentioned the first time around that uh, that I have gleaned a lot from uh, what you've uploaded. And I uh, sense that from that first episode, um, I've had multiple people reach out to me. And they you you have some new subscribers. So oh, uh, they've been going through some of your playlists, and they enjoyed it as well. Uh, so like I said, tonight what I would like to – talk about is going to be eschatology. And um, eschatology is is uh, growing in popularity right now. It's always popular. Everybody wants to talk about end times. The renewed interest, and particularly, it seems as if people have broadened their horizons a little bit. And yeah. words, you know, uh, you know like uh, preterism, partial preterism, they're, they're, they're not bad words any longer to many groups, <laughs> I can tell. At least, at least in my group uh, uh, that I have belonged to for a long time. Uh, People are willing to kind of um, uh, go back to the drawing table to some extent and uh, review what they believe and, and at least at least get to know what these other positions are. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on, uh, Bruce, was to talk about the topic of post-millennialism. So if, if you would, if you don't mind, let's begin with kind of sketching what are the basic positions of uh, end times or eschatology. Sure. Yeah, well— uh, most people would say there's three views that uh, are most commonly referred to, and they are either premillennialism, postmillennial, or amillennialism. Uh, premillennialism believes that <clears throat> Jesus returns at some point in the future and establishes an earthly kingdom, and he will rule here. Usually, the theory is from Jerusalem as a distinct human being in uh, a kind of historical setting in which. The rule of Christ is extended around the world, and it's a time of peace and so on. And that has given rise to the the term millennium. So usually if you say to somebody millennium, the term carries a certain degree of baggage, and it has to do with a kind of ideal living situation where lions lie down with lambs, literally, and where... Uh, you know, you don't have sickness and disease and that sort of thing. That, that is what many people conceive of when they hear the term millennium. Of course, the Bible never uses that term. The only time you have anything like it is when in Revelation 20, uh, there's a reference to a thousand years, which is exactly what the term millennium means. But what that is right. referring to in Revelation is, a, of course, a debated point. Well, uh, in the second century of the church's history, Uh, If there was any millennial theory at all that was bandied about, it was probably some form of premillennialism. Not much was said about it, but to the extent there was any discussion, it tended to reflect that premillennial view. I've read the, uh, you know, the anti-Nicene Fathers, and you have to say it's very rare that the topic actually comes up. But when, when it does, it tends to reflect that view. Probably the best explanation for that is that you had a lot of a Jewish influence in the Christian world 
which had traditionally looked for a Messiah who would establish an earthly kingdom. And now the expectation was that Jesus had left. He's going to come right back and establish that kingdom. And so you have that expectation that was more or less, uh, at least, uh, I would say to the degree you found anything, it'd be some form of that. By the third and fourth centuries, premillennialism had pretty much disappeared from the conversation. And the church was moving more to a, a kind of view of history as going on for a long time moving towards some great destiny, some conclusion, and uh, that the kingdom that we're referring to is one that Jesus has already established. We're not looking forward to the kingdom. We're living in the kingdom. Augustine was the one who really put a, uh, you know, a sharp point on that in his great work, uh, The City of God. And uh, he came up with something that is called, not by him, but by later commentators, amillennialism. The reason the term was coined was simply to say this is not premillennialism. So it's ah millennialism, meaning your idea of a millennium as some future ideal political rule by Messiah is in fact not a correct view. So it's ah millennial in that sense. It's not ah millennial, however, in the sense that when the Bible speaks of a thousand year period of time, that is a real era, that's a real historical a fact right. that that could go on for a thousand years or a lot more, you know, but it, it's mm -hmm. just a term that refers to an extended period. Postmillennialism is a term that really got some traction really in the Puritan period. They were the first ones who I would say rolled out an idea that has come to be called postmillennialism. And the reason the word post is used is because especially Jonathan Edwards and other Puritans uh, believe that history was not only going somewhere, but it was going to reach a kind of final chapter. And some people thought that chapter would last for a thousand years. This was part of real history. It's not like Christ returned and established this, but just the influence of the gospel and history would bring about an extended period of time at some point in the future where the great benefits of the gospel would really stretch around the world, as Isaiah says, the knowledge of God would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, you know, and that idea. Right. And so those two, amillennialism and postmillennialism, have a lot in common. And in many ways, you would say it's a very fuzzy line that separates the two, yeah. but both are very distinctly different from premillennialism, which is an entirely different view of what's happening in history. So at least in a preliminary way, that's kind of the, the, the general idea. Right, right, exactly, and that's all that. I, yeah, that's that's good. Just kind of something basic to. Uh, I said, I think I said sink their teeth in, but I meant yeah. cut their teeth on is what I meant to yeah. say. But uh, yeah, so um, let's let's do this then. So um, uh, both uh, all millennial and post millennial would be considered a form of preterism, right? But there are also two different types of preterism now. Uh, uh, my audience is not going to be familiar with that, and they're not going to know really the difference between what would be considered or, or referred to as a full, a full preterist position and a partial preterist position. Do, so right. do you mind defining what that term is, uh, sure. preterism, and then what is the difference between the two? And where is that line of, of orthodoxy? Because, Bruce, I think that um, partial preterism is referred to as orthodox preterism. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think, yeah. Right. Well, the you know the idea is that that when we read the New Testament, we run into uh, texts that are predictive prophecy. Uh, certainly, Revelation we talk about separately, but you think about the Olivet Discourse. Yeah, uh, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus spells out uh, some rather distinct predictions about what would be happening in the future. And those predictions uh, could be conceived of as things that would happen uh, way out at the end of history, thousands of years maybe in the future. But it also may be describing events that would take place within the near term, that is within the lifetime of the people to whom he was giving these comments, you know. Well, I grew up in a tradition that basically viewed the Olivet Discourse as describing end times. Uh, and I just took that for granted. When you're eight years old, you don't really, you know, raise critical <laughs> questions. I just yeah. assumed that somebody knew the right answer, and that's what I accepted. And 
I don't suppose it was till I, I was out of you know college uh, that that I really had an opportunity to realize that's not the only game in town. Uh, that there are other views, and I think the the most striking statement that raises considerable questions about that sort of futurist view is Jesus <clears throat> saying at the end of the Olivet Discourse. Uh, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass from the scene till all these things have taken place. You know, well, the facial sense of that would be that Jesus is speaking about the generation in which he was living. Right. That, uh, at the most, maybe 40 years from the time when he was making those comments, all of the things he predicted in the Olivet Discourse would take place. Well, that was kind of news to me. I'd never heard anything like that. And I assumed anyone that would say such a thing must be some kind of heretic, you know. That yeah, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's uncomfortable in the beginning. That's right. But, uh, and and of course, when you read uh, some of the people that try to make an end run around that statement, they'll either do, like how Lindsay made famous the notion of the fig tree generation, that what, Je what Jesus was referring to was a future generation, and that when you see certain events take place in the future, that would inaugurate that generation to, of which he was speaking. Well, that is uh, that's a stretch at best, you know, to right. to through it that way. Certainly, no one that Jesus was, no one that heard Jesus say that in the first century would have construed it that way. That would not be the sense at all. The other way it sometimes dealt with was that the word that Je Jesus used, genea is the word, the Greek word uh, translated generation, can also mean a race or a kind. And so Jesus was really saying this race, referring to Jewish people, will not pass from the scene to all the, till all these things <clears throat> take place. The difficulty with that is that's not the meaning of the word. There's two Greek words, genos and genea. And, uh, and the two words have different meanings. Genos means a race. It can mean a, <clears throat> you know, a kind, a species of people. Uh, Peter says you're a chosen race. The word they use there is genos. But whenever the New Testament uses the word genea, different word, different gender, uh, it means a time-limited era, usually maybe 25 to 40 years. And that is the word Jesus uses and so, again, you'd have to say on the face of it, it appears that Jesus is describing events that took place within the lifetime of those people who were hearing him say these things, you know. And so, well, it's that view. I mean, that's the problem. And that would give rise to an understanding. Well, maybe at least some of what we run into in the New Testament uh, in terms of predicted prophecy is not predicting things thousands of years in the future, but things in the immediate future of the people to whom he was addressing his comments. So that gives rise to what's called partial preterism, meaning preterist means past, like past tense, preterist tense would be the past tense, meaning that a lot of the New Testament predictive prophecy is referring to events that took place within the lifetime of those people that heard him say it, but not all of it, that there would be things in right. the New Testament that are still looking forward to a second advent, a second coming, an end of history, a consummation of history, you know. So uh, uh, that, that would be what you call orthodox preterism, because it's orthodox in the sense that it stays within the boundaries of classical orthodoxy, which, among other things, says that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, from whence he will return to judge the quick and the dead. And, right. And that statement is made with respect to people who are living in times past the first century. You know, we're, we're out here at other times in history. Full preterism kind of took the next step and said, well, now, wait a minute. If some of the predictive prophecy in the New Testament was, was referring to events in the near term, what about maybe all of the predictive prophecy in the New Testament? Maybe all of it is referring to events in the first century. And that would give rise to an idea that the actual second coming, as it's commonly called, actually took place as part of the package of events that took place in the first century. And so full preterists, which have always been a fairly tiny minority, have nevertheless, you know, been beating the drum for that for some time. There was a character I want his name is that Stuart Russell is that right I think was his name yeah I think so yeah who wrote a book called Perusia 
in which he argued that particular position. Uh, in the 20th century, we had various people out there taking the same view. It basically would say that all of the predictive prophecy in the New Testament has happened, it's passed, it's over, and history is now just going to keep going with no particular trajectory in mind, except usually there's an idea of a gradual growth of the kingdom, but no end, no consummation of human right. vision. So, you know, that's I'm my own view is a partial preterism. <clears throat> I have to say to you, Tyler, I don't I don't like that term. I don't voluntarily use it unless I'm forced yeah. to. Because <laughs> honestly, I don't like to be partial anything. Right. I like to be yeah, yeah. totally I, I tell you I like to be totally, completely, hundred percent for Jesus. I am for Jesus hundred percent There we go. No partiality about it. But if you're going to put a gun to my head and force me to say, what's your position? I'll say, okay, okay, right. yeah, partial preterist, you know, right. get that kind yeah. of partiality out of me. So, that's good. That's, that's good. Now, I'm assuming uh, that the diff that the reason why partial preterism is referred to as orthodox preterism, whereas obvi and and full preterism is uh, referred to as unorthodox preterism, yeah. I'm assuming the difference is that um, – the partial preterist view still holds to tenets that would be considered orthodox Christianity, the yeah. fundamentals that are, you know, the resurrection is still to come, the judgment is still to come, right. uh, and that is that there is a bodily resurrection, that Christ's coming uh, is still in the future, and that is a literal, physical coming of Christ to judge the quick and the dead, as you mentioned. Yeah. And then there will be an ushering in of a, an eternal state as well that follows, and that's all orthodox Christianity. Yes. Therefore, if you hold to a position— that denies or rejects any of those, you know, doctrines, you might say, then that would be an unorthodox view. Yes, that's right. And right. It, it and, usually, and full preterism <clears throat> rejects all of that. Yeah, the, the orthodoxy is, I think, cl classically defined as a theology that stays within the boundaries of what are called the ecumenical creeds of the church. And that is especially connected to the Nicene Creed, and the, uh, uh, and the Chalcedonian symbol, uh, you know, 451, and maybe behind all of those, the Apostles' Creed, which nobody knows exactly when that was uh, crafted, probably right. sometime in the second century, but again, it would be part of that uh, collection of creedal statements, which have been regarded as de definitive of classical Orthodox Christianity, and certainly every one of them affirms a future return of Jesus a resurrection right. of the dead, and that sort of thing. So when someone says, well, I, I believe the resurrection has already happened, it's in the past tense, the second coming has already happened, and by definition, that falls outside the bounds of classical orthodoxy. <clears throat> and, you know, in, in so far as uh, it violates those rules, then it would it would no longer be considered orthodox. And, and the people usually who take that view are aware of that. Right. And they would say, well, you know, the, the, I've heard it said to me, I've had it said to me more than once, well, the creeds are overrated. Those are just the productions of human You'd creation. have to say that. You know, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what you have to I say, well, okay, I don't hold that the creeds are infallible in the sense that the Bible is infallible, but I do right. uh, maintain that we should have a lot of respect for our fathers and the faith, and, and at this point, Absolutely. I'm not willing to, to walk away from what they've affirmed. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, the Bible, obviously, is, as is said so often, the Bible is my final authority. But that's not to say that there aren't other authorities. God yes. instituted other authorities, and the church is one of them. And the church today has authority. It has power that's been given to it. Um, additionally, or furthermore, the church in the past had authority uh, at that time as well. And, and, and it, we, could, we would, should respect that power and authority. That's not to say that it's infallible, That's but right. we use God's Word as our filter to look at it, but we still view the church as what God, how God created it to be. Yeah, yeah I totally agree with that. Okay, um, so you, you, you kind of got into the other question I was going to ask is, what position do you hold to? And we, and we also talked about this a little bit in the other episode, but this is what I'm excited about. Yeah, well, I, I do believe that the Olivet Discourse is describing events in the first century. And in fact, when you read it, anyone who's familiar with what actually happened in the first century would say uh, that this is almost a, a stunning prediction of what actually occurred. 
And when Jesus said, for example, uh, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, don't waste any time, get out of town, you know. Well, as a matter of fact, in the year 66, Jerusalem was surrounded briefly by armies. Usually the problem has been, how do you leave a city that's surrounded by armies? It's hard to escape from a place that's under siege, you know. Uh, and and uh, so that seemed to be a dilemma. But in 66 AD, Jerusalem was surrounded by armies. A Syrian Roman army came down. They left after two weeks, and all the Christians in town were going, whoa, that sounds just like what Jesus said, and they got out of town. They, they escaped, uh, you know, into the Judean wilderness. Some went across the Jordan. Uh, Eusebius gives us details about that, and, and so Christian people escaped from Jerusalem at the very time that other people in Israel to escape the, the campaign of Vespasian, who was coming in from the north, were going to Jerusalem. So the Christians are leaving while everybody else is entering Jerusalem, thinking it'll be safe. Jerusalem was put under siege again sometime later, and in that case, the siege was not lifted until the city was destroyed. Million, you know, it was, it was a horrific bloodbath. Uh, upwards of a million people died. The rest were hauled off into captivity. And the Christians basically escaped all of that because they took seriously Jesus' warning. Uh, so, in other words, that all seems to fit very nicely with a with a, a view of you know a historical realization of that. And uh, and then you know what else do we have in the New Testament? We have the Book of Revelation, which also seems in the main to be describing the same events. It's doing it in apocalyptic categories, so it's more poetic, it's more symbolic, but it really does follow in some ways the same kind of narrative except that the book of Revelation still allows for an unwritten chapter. You know, the seven thunders that uh, show up in right. chapter 10. Seal up that, don't write that down. Well, seal up is a technical term biblically to say this is referring to something way out in the future. So the time is not ripe to, to roll it out. The same thing was said to Daniel, you know. Uh, the, the book of, or the 20th chapter that speaks of a thousand year period of time seems to be forecasting something that goes well beyond that generation. Those are, you know, there's no great definitive description of the details of yeah. what will happen in the end, but there's enough there to say there is an end. And we're not there yet. And so yeah. that's why we would say some but not all of the predictive prophecy in the New Testament is forecasting something that still extends out into the distant future. Right, right. So that would be, you said you're reluctant to use the designation, but that would be a partial preterist view. Yes. Right. And then what would be of, so of the the uh, partial preterist views, there would be an amillennial position, a postmillennial position. And you said you hold to postmillennialism. Well, yeah, I do uh, loosely. I'm, I'm certainly one or the other. <clears throat> what I believe is this, that the kingdom is growing and expanding. It started as a mustard seed, innocuous. Nobody would have thought it would amount to much, even though Jesus lived a remarkable life. If you'd been living in the first century in and around the time of the gospel events, you would think, you know, what's this going to amount to? How can uh, 12 blue collar workers go out and change the world? I mean, give me a break. You know, that would be your thought that, yeah. that, that you know, this is. And Jesus said that it's going to start in a in a sort of tiny, almost unnoticed way, like a mustard seed, but would gradually over time grow, insinuating itself and becoming more and more dominant. Something like the little stone back in Daniel chapter two that grows and grows until finally it dominates the whole earth. And it does seem to me that Old and New Testament alike envision a growing kingdom, which is heading towards some great moment in which the effects of the gospel really do swamp the entire world. Right. It doesn't mean that everybody in the world becomes a Bible-banging Christian. You know, it doesn't mean right. that. But it means that the broad effects, the influences of the gospel touch the entire world. And in fact, as we read in Revelation chapter 15, Every nation will come and bow before him. I mean, that kind of language is used to describe yeah. the idea that there is a time when a, a sort of universal consensus yeah. that the Christian, the Christian answer is the right answer. That'll become the dominant view throughout the world. And, 
Now, whether it lasts for a thousand years, who knows? I mean, post millennialism yeah. says that will become a dominant sort of influence in the world for an extended period of time. And at the end of that, things are going to kind of come off the axles, you know, but but right, it right. will be released and all of that. But uh, but that there'd be this extended period of blessedness. I like that view. Jonathan Edwards was the one who really championed it. I've read him. I like what he says. I think it may be the right answer. I'm not going to die at a stake for that one. But I will. I will right. be at a stake for some things. That's not necessarily one of them. But right. I do think that's. Uh, I think that's a good view, a good understanding of what the scriptures are saying. Right. Yeah. So you um uh you described how the there will be a point in which basically the gospel will permeate all nations, right? right. Uh, I think you use the word swamp. It'll, it, yeah. it will be, it will cover the earth uh, as in all nations in some sense will be converted. And, you know, and, and uh, not in some sense, all nations will be converted as a motif throughout the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. you quoted a couple of those earlier on um, uh, in discussing partial preterism at one point. But um, so a cu- that, that kind of has a couple of questions from my perspective, right, um, uh, and those that would be more so in my circles, independent Baptists. So they would, at this point, they would ask the question, well, you know, if he's coming back post-mill, like after the millennial, that raises a lot of issues from what would be their point of view, a pre-millennial perspective. And probably one of the first things that they would they would ask is, if Christ is coming back after the millennial reign, you know how is he going to reign from Jerusalem? Well, yeah, and I guess that presupposes that he would reign from Jerusalem. I, I'm not right. sure that would be that would be the question to answer. Is where right, exactly right. Have, do we have that? And uh, in any event, the New Testament is quite emphatic that there is an old Jerusalem and a new Jerusalem. And the old Jerusalem, Paul tells us in Galatians, is the city that was in the Middle East, a real tangible city that was in bondage with her children. But Paul says the true Jerusalem is from above, and she's the mother of us all. We're told in Hebrews chapter 12 that we have come to the new Jerusalem. We've come to, uh, you know, not a physical uh, city that's there uh, in the Middle East, as much as we love that city, and it's a great place to visit, you know, and all of that. But nevertheless, we would say that is no longer the the Jerusalem that is referred to in terms of redemptive history. We are Jerusalem. We are the house of God. We're the city of God. Uh, and and so in terms of Jerusalem, Jesus is dwelling and real ruling in his Jerusalem right now, right. as far as he's living in and dwelling in his people who are told expressly that uh, we are the ones who reign on earth. We, through the power of the gospel, the sword that comes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, are reigning. It may not be a political reign, but preferably it isn't, but it's the reign that comes through the power of God's word. And so, uh, so I'd say, you know, the idea of Jesus ruling from Jerusalem has been fully realized, is being realized in history as we continue to uh, carry the name of Jesus around the world and see the the wonderful effects that that has. Yeah, so I would say a really powerful evidence as well um, is Psalm 110, verse one. It's yeah. the most quoted verse in the New Testament, and it yeah. is um, the it is the messianic reign that it is referring to, and, yeah. and we all identify it as such. And in that. You know, it's the most quoted verse in the New Testament, and in that very verse, it tells us that Christ is going to reign at or from the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made his footstool. Yes, that's exactly right. I think that's what 1 Corinthians 15 is is suggesting, and, and that's the spirit of the New Testament, that we have we have a commission to go into all the world, not part of it, all of it, to make disciples of all the nations, to teach them to obey all that Jesus commanded with the promise that he'll be with us all ways. Now, it's hard for me to believe that if Jesus gave that command and promised to be with his people uh, through the project, that it's going to end in failure. I mean, right. when did Jesus fail? This is, yeah, this, right. you know, this is exactly what we are about. We're sending increasingly, we're sending the, the gospel message around the world, and we're seeing its wonderful effects and fruits. 
And uh, I think we can expect that that will continue. I don't think we're going to see the end of this in my lifetime. You know, I, we're one little cog in the in the great story here, but we right. all do what we can to facilitate this growth. Looking forward to that time when, in fact, the gospel does have this wonderful widespread effect throughout the world. Right. Yeah, so in that case, what it would be is that the, the nature of Christ's rule and the nature of Christ's kingdom would look differently than the, what the pre-mill position yes. would posit. Yes. Right. Well, okay. Yeah. So I, oh, I was just going to say, you know, the, the pre-mill position uh, is inherently pessimistic. I know pre-millennial people get irritated with me when I say that, but it does, in fact, I mean, this goes back to the Schofield Bible and Darby and the whole birth of dispensational thought was predicated on the idea that things are getting worse, Right. that we are heading into the end times and things are <laughs> things get ugly. We're in the Laodicean age, the lukewarm church. I mean, this is things are kind of going down in a sort of spiral toward a bad outcome. And Jesus comes essentially to a failed church that has not realized what the Great Commission demanded. And I have a hard time finding anything like that credibly in the New Testament. It seems like the, the breathing sense of the New Testament is that God has commissioned us to do something Herculean, but we can do it with his presence and his grace and his help and his strength, and that we should be highly optimistic in thinking where history is going, even though, Tyler, at any given moment, uh, it may seem like things are getting worse. I mean, I feel like right now in the United States, things are not improving much. You know, the right, morning right. newspaper doesn't doesn't really reinforce my theology. But fortunately, right. I don't let the newspaper interpret the Bible. I let the Bible interpret the newspaper. And so sometimes there's fits and starts in this. But in the great sweep of history, there is unmistakably and irrefutably a growth. And that is... You know, that's just as easily to, easy to document as anything that we could document in history and growth. Yeah, and we tend growth. to have an right. ethnocentrism sort of view oh, as well, yes. that it's, yeah. you know, if, if it's not going to happen through America, it's not going to happen at exactly. all, right? So yeah. if, if things are bad here, then things must be bad all throughout the world. Yeah. And we have an eth ethnocentrism view because we have an egocentrism yeah, right. problem, right? So we have we're... We have that kind of what's called chronological snobbery that we think we, we must be living in the most important moment of all. Exactly. It, it's all about me, you know. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, if it's falling apart where I am, then the whole world right. is falling apart because yeah, that's, that's right. what matters. That's what, that's how we think, truly. Yeah. And, and uh, another uh, thing I was going to say earlier, you were talking about how the um, – the, with the view of postmillennialism, that things are getting better. I believe last time you referred to it as the the, the theology of hope, and yes. things are getting better, and that eventually there will be a, a sort of apostasy at the end, and that's what we yeah. see at the end of Revelation twenty, um, mm -hmm. that uh, the devil goes forth and that he deceives the nations. And uh, you were you were at that point what the uh, what you were um, uh, arguing for was that. All nations, though, in spite of there being an apostasy, all nations will be converted. That doesn't mean, obviously, every single person. And I heard a couple of interesting um, um, evidences for that recently. The way they were phrased was, one said, uh, from the parable of Christ as he speaks of the, the wheat and the tares, mm -hmm. uh, there will be tares, but it's still yeah. a wheat field. Yes. It's still a wheat that's field. Right. So that, that, that's like a, that. a, a very interesting <laughs> point that I had never thought of, and I just yeah. recently came across that. And then another... Another point um, as well to that uh, that has been used on the postmillennial side uh, for quite some time is that the devil has to have someone to deceive, right? He, <laughs> right. The nations. Yeah. The nations obviously have been converted. There must be, right. in whatever sense, you know, whether people like this uh, phraseology or not, um, there must be a universal church, right? There well, must that, be— that's excellent. I like both of those. You know, I'm going to write those down as soon as we're done. Those are both great illustrations of the point. They're powerful, yeah. I thought so, too. Yeah. They yeah. definitely did not originate with me, but they're they're very powerful. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I liked uh, last time how you referred to it as the theology of hope, yes. and uh, I believe that that not only I mean obviously inside of all of us we yearn um, for Eden, so we look for that hope, and God has you know pre-programmed us for that. But but additionally, it's I don't I don't think that it's only innate that we that we like that. I I think that it it also coincides with the gospel. 
Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. with the, just the 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 it is the gospel, but even just on a personal level of our personal salvation, uh, yeah. the hope that we receive from that, it is the gospel in a in a in a more general sense yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. It's you know, you think about Christian sanctification is certainly a personal thing. We right. all are hopefully growing in faith and growing in our uh, uh, maturity, that sort of thing. But I think you can also at least extend that to some degree to a global thing and say there's a kind of sanctification of the whole world that represents not individual people, but this broader influence of the gospel everywhere. And that is part of what that hope is. We hopefully see uh, a, you know, a, a sort of increasingly enlightened understanding of how we should be treating each other as human beings. I, you know, I, I, I love the history of the United States, and I think it's interesting that when the United States uh, established its philosophical foundations and said something so radical, so unexpected and astonishing as we told this to be self-evident that all people are created equal, I mean, at the time that statement was made, you would have a hard time finding anybody that would buy off on yeah. that except people mm. in the colonies. Right. Because, uh, in, in England and in every European nation and certainly in other parts of the world, that would just mm-hmm. be laughed out of the court uh, you know, on the spot because it was right. assumed that, that some people were. Well, today, that is a view that is much more widely accepted. You know, And where did that come from? It was, right. it was the United States— a champion of that idea. We got it from the gospel, and now it's become a, a kind of a standard, uh, you know, sort of article of faith in, in many different political systems. That's just one example. Of That's a really faith. interesting example. Yeah. Uh, you know, just yeah. to think of something like a, that is a lower order, you know, ide- idea or a yeah. lower order, you know, uh, just a, a piece of philosophy. I mean, it's so it's so small that you want to maybe like an article, like you use that, um, <laughs> and, and, and how that alone is stems and comes from Christianity and the gospel, yeah. Yeah. and it, it even that thought itself has swamped the world yes, and changed exactly. nations. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's an amazing uh, concept. That's a super interesting uh, example. Okay, uh, the last thing that I wanted to, to – and I wanted to spend more time on this, if you don't mind, is I wanted to talk about – um, the date of the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we didn't get into a, a whole lot as far as um, uh, the whole the, the the layout of post millennialism, and and maybe again if you have time, it'll probably uh, be a little bit longer, um, maybe a couple months out that I could have you back on because uh, I have a few other people <laughs> scheduled. But nonetheless, maybe we could talk about post millennialism um, in uh, more depth, just from different perspectives mm-hmm. later. But this is a really important uh, yeah. uh, view, yeah. right? Absolutely. It's it's going to determine a lot of things. That right. is the dating of the book of Revelation. That's right. what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to yeah. spend some time on that. First, if you don't mind just kind of explaining why that matters so much. Why yeah. does uh, the dating of the book of Revelation or you know the authorship in particular is what we're right. referring to? Right. Well, yeah, and that's – it's a it's – a, Great question, and it uh, would probably, uh, to do it right, would take you know, more time than we're willing to give it right now. But the short answer is that it has everything to do with how you interpret the meaning of the book to understand when it was produced. The two major theories are that it was produced sometime around 65, let's say, in round, you know, round numbers, so to speak. Uh, and that would put it under the reign of Nero, and that basically the tumultuous times that are being described in Revelation are reflecting the condition of the world and the church under the reign of Nero. The other view is that it's written more like around 95 AD, that's the late date, and that the tumultuous times there are referring to a brief persecution that took place under a Roman emperor named Domitian. So those are the two views early date, 65, late date, 95. The late date has been the majority view, probably, uh, well, I'm sure it's still the majority view to this day. Uh, And the reason for that is because there's a statement that uh, was made by Irenaeus, writing in about the year 180 in his book Against Heresies, in which he's really writing about Gnosticism and so on. But in that connection, he makes a statement 
that appears on the face of it to say that Revelation was produced around the year 95. Ken Gentry has done some excellent work parsing that sentence. And I think for anybody that reads Greek and knows Greek, as you probably do and I do, that you can see he makes a very compelling case that uh, even though on the face of it, you could read what Irenaeus is saying uh, to stand for the idea that Revelation was written in 95, it's perfectly legitimate to understand that rather to be referring to John himself who survived arguably until 95. And that the statement, no matter how you cut it, is at best a little bit ambiguous. And he makes that case at a fairly technical level in a book entitled Before Jerusalem Fell. So if anyone wants to look at that more <clears throat> closely, then that would be a good book to read. It's, it's readable, he's a scholar, but it's certainly a readable book. Well, uh, allowing for the fact that uh, that that may that the fact that Irenaeus says that has carried much more probably weight than it should have, uh, at least opens the door to the possibility maybe we should rethink that question. My own experience, I, I used to take the late view because that's what everybody did. Uh, and the one of the convenient aspects of that was that if Revelation was describing events from a 95 AD perspective, that you would have to say virtually nothing that Revelation describes if you try to translate it into actual history. None of it actually happened in the near term. Does that make sense? So, you know, Revelation says right. these things are just about to happen. Mm -hmm. says it seven times and you know again and again these things are about to happen so if i read it from a 95 a.d perspective and the book says these things are just about to happen i look at history and i say nothing like that actually happened the collapse of a great city to which rome didn't happen it didn't burn none of the stuff that you find kind of in very uh, powerful terms happened it causes a person to say, well, maybe when John said these things were about to happen, he didn't mean these things were about to happen. He was using what? Poetic language or something. And that maybe uh, he's actually describing things that are going to take place way out in the future. And that language of imminence is just to kind of keep us on our toes. So that's been one view. The other view of people that take the late date would be more by liberal scholars who say, John certainly meant that these things were just about to happen. He got it wrong. They didn't right, happen. Right. Therefore, the book of Revelation, nice try, John. That's a good effort or whoever wrote it, you know. But uh, the fact of the matter is Revelation got the wrong answer. And those are the, that's vastly the majority of people that take the late date. Right. They're either taking the view that Revelation doesn't mean what it says, namely these things are just about to happen, or they're liberals and they don't care whether Revelation got the right answer because they don't affirm biblical inerrancy or infallibility or any such thing. All right. The early date, uh, putting it at 65, is striking because when you read the descriptions of what happened in the immediate time frame that we're speaking of, from let's say 64 to 70, it fits almost to a point of being irrefutable that it's highly descriptive of the events that took place in that time frame. My own experience of being <sighs> exposed to an alternative view took, back way, took place way back in the 1980s uh, when the pastor of University Presbyterian Church in Seattle, a man named Earl Palmer, did a series on Revelation. These are not on YouTube or anything like that. This is before YouTube existed or, or the internet, you know, was really anything that people relied on. But he did a series, I listened to them on cassette tape, in which he argued that Revelation can only be rightly understood if we read it, understanding that it was written under the reign of Nero. I'd never heard such a thing. This was a mainline you know, highly respected, widely published Presbyterian pastor in Seattle, Earl Palmer. Some of your folks have probably heard his name, retired now. In fact, I think he's deceased now. I'm not sure about that. But but anyway, this was years ago. And he made such a case. It, it just, it shook me up, you know. And I, I thought, wow, I need to rethink this. 
I'd always thought it was just kind of, you know, goofy people that thought of an early date for Revelation. I later read a book by a fellow named David Chilton. This was in the 90s, entitled Days of Vengeance. It's about a 300-page book or so. He just goes through in meticulous detail, documenting again and again and again how the descriptive uh, images that are used in Revelation are, are almost a perfect match for events that actually took place under the reign of Nero. And that book is, is highly compelling, I think. Many others, of course, uh, uh, Ken Gentry has done important work in this. I read a book by a fellow named John A.T. Robinson, who's a Cambridge scholar, not a conservative at all. He's a, uh, but a mainline, highly respected scholar. Uh, and uh, he wrote a book called Redating the New Testament. And just his chapter on Revelation alone is worth the cost of the book. I mean, he makes a, a powerful case that Revelation has to be treated as a document written under the reign of Nero. It only makes sense if we mm -hmm. view it that way. Uh, Josephine Byrd, uh, the, new, the uh, uh, Notre Dame scholar, um, Josephine Mag Mazendi, Mazingberg, um, I'm botching her name. I haven't thought about it for a while now, but anyway, <laughs> it'll come to me here in a minute. But anyway, <laughs> she wrote uh, the Anchor Bible Series commentary on Revelation. She was caught in a very ticklish position because she wanted to follow the majority view of a late date. And yet, when she read Revelation, she had to admit it seems to describe events that took place under Nero. And she actually came up with what has been a rather distinct, in fact, I would say virtually unique view that associated with her, uh, which said, well, there were two editions. So Revelation was written in the main under the early time frame, and then a second edition came out under Domitian. So she kind of, you know, hedges. Wow. Her best. I've never heard that. But you know, but but that's her view. Yeah. Anchor Bible series, uh, and it's, uh, you know, and, and, but again, it simply, it simply makes the point that before people dismiss the early view of Revelation, right. they should take a closer look. There's a lot of horsepower in that particular uh, position. Right, yeah, and that, that uh, uh, I can't remember what you said her name was, but the, her Joseph creating... Joseph Massingbird, Massingford... Ford. I think her last name is Ford. I'm sorry. That's a. I. I oh, that's okay. Yeah. This is old yeah. Age. I was just gonna re reference her theory. I mean, that kind of gives you um, a little bit of a of an idea if you're not familiar with this topic and this controversy on why it matters so much too. The yeah. fact that she's having to create this theory, right. and it can be. I you know. I believe that it is a determining factor on the events of the Book of Revelation. Yes, absolutely. Right. And. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So um, if, if the book of Revelation was written uh, before 70 AD, um, then almost certainly it is that is prophesying and looking forward to the bulk of the book of Revelation, of course, um, the events that took place in 70 yes. yeah, AD. So, and that yeah, would be the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah, and the events leading up to it, and right. you certainly, you certainly have. If you just read the book casually, you you're impressed with the fact that the book of Revelation presupposes that there is still a temple standing in Jerusalem, which would yeah. not be true after 70 A.D. Presupposes yeah. that there's still a city of Jerusalem, you know, right? Where also, and that was, was going to be my next question: was what yeah. are some of the what are some of the things that you see in the Book of Revelation itself? Because I'll admit, I'll, I'll throw this out there before before you give us those uh, those the, these reasons yeah. why you're compelled from the from the Book of Revelation. Um, uh, I will admit that the quotation from Ira from uh, Irenaeus yeah. is a powerful quotation yeah. Yeah. if it's translated properly, like you said. Um, but the overwhelming evidence that it was written before 70 AD from the book of Revelation. Uh, well, there is overwhelming evidence yeah. that it was written before 70 AD when we look at and we study the book of Revelation. Yeah. And um, so, uh, Brother Bruce, do you mind giving us some of those evidences? Yeah, well, it's, it is uh, the, the book of Revelation speaks of two cities— both of which are named Jerusalem, you know, 
uh, that in itself would not be possible really in 95. I mean, Jerusalem was not rebuilt really until sometime later. It was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. It was a wasteland for years to come. Eventually, obviously, a, a city was rebuilt and it's called Jerusalem. But from the point of view of the book of Revelation, uh, this, the old covenant capital of the, of the world, really, in the old covenant era was a, was a city in the Middle East, which was destroyed. And the book of Revelation seems to contemplate the destruction of that old city and another city coming in in its place that's called expressly the New Jerusalem. And, of course, the last several chapters of the book of Revelation speak repeatedly of a new Jerusalem. Well, a new Jerusalem certainly presupposes there must be an old Jerusalem. Right. The old Jerusalem is not called that, but it is called things like Babylon, you know, right. uh, the harlot city, mm -hmm. uh, where, and, and in fact, uh, John, the author of Revelation, says in chapter 11 uh, that this, is, this city is called figuratively Sodom and, and uh, Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. You know, there's not too many cities in the world of which that statement can be made. Right, it's right. Especially referring to Jerusalem. And so you have that notion that, that the old covenant is being set aside, dismantled, and it's going to take place in a kind of traumatic way. The city will have to be finally in a devastating way destroyed. It's gone, kaput, and a new Jerusalem, which is a living city, a living temple in which God now inhabits his people, is coming in. And the true Jerusalem in this world today is constituted by what Peter calls living stones. We're a, we're a temple of living stones taken together. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. This is the true Jerusalem, and we're all over the world. Jerusalem's all over the world today because Christian people are all over the world so you kind of see that paradigm in, in Revelation that there's a shift. There's a move away from one. The old covenant's being closed down, brought under judgment, end of story, a new Jerusalem, a new covenant era, a kingdom. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, so on. That's the, that's the other theme. So one is you know, taking shape as the other one disappears into history. Yeah, so the Jerusalem is standing from the yeah. perspective of the author. That's the that's the first evidence. Yeah. And so, what would you say is a, is another evidence uh, for a, an early date for the Book of Revelation? Well, just the the um, the general description. For example, the cities that are mentioned in the twelve, the uh, seven cities: oh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira. Those uh, they are certainly descriptive of the condition of those cities at the early time. Now, some people would say, well, uh, they might be descriptive of the later time. I'm not saying that's a defining argument, but it's certainly one that right. is worth mentioning. One of the cities called Philadelphia had a several name changes along the way. It went by, had a, like I know, three or four different names that it had. It just so happens that the, the name that would apply at the time would, in fact, be Philadelphia as opposed to some mm -hmm. of those other ones. So that's a little bit more of a time stamp. Um, yeah, and you mentioned earlier um, the Nero reigning, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, so he would be the, the sixth uh, yeah. head. Yeah. Right. Chapter 17 is, is sometimes called the time stamp of Revelation because there uh, John says, you know, the— this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. So the seven hills obviously would be Rome. Rome was propping up Jerusalem, the harlot that's sitting there. They're, they're, two, different, they're two different entities. You have Rome propping up Jerusalem. Right. And then the seven kings, you begin with Julius Caesar, who was who was the first Caesar. That was the common view. He didn't really reign as a Caesar, but, but he was certainly uh, universally regarded at that time as the first Caesar. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think there's some strong evidence for that. One of them I heard from you, and that was jo um, uh, uh, Suetonius. Suetonius. So I know Josephus wrote also, and Josephus yeah. actually identified um, 
uh, Julius Caesar as yeah. the first emperor. So that was that was the commonly held belief at that Absolutely. time that yeah. he was that yeah. he was emperor number one. So if we begin right. counting with Julius Caesar, yeah. according to Josephus, who was a contemporary of John, so right. this is obviously what was the you know the beliefs of that time. This was the the order of the emperors um, that would put Nero as the sixth. That's right. And uh, and then I I learned from you that Suetonius in the twelve Caesars he mm-hmm. also notated this. Yeah, he did. That's right. He started with Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar created the empire. That's the right. Thing. He didn't really yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. But yeah. The, uh, when he crossed the Rubicon and took on Pompey yeah. and they had the Civil War, that was the end of the game. That was the end of the Roman Republic. That was the beginning of the imperial. And yep. so Caesar gets credit for that, even if he didn't have a chance to enjoy it very much, you know. Right. Then uh, his nephew uh, Octavian took over. He's Augustus Caesar, ruling when when Jesus was born. Tiberius is next. Caligula's next. Claudius is next. So that's five of them. And then the next one is uh, is Nero, and he was he would have been ruling at the time that these uh, events took place. And his name has an interesting coincidence with the, the numeric value 666. So there's a little argument there. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to hang my hat on that one, but it's certainly, right. Right. Uh, and he, know, and he is uh, the first Roman emperor to heavily persecute the yeah. Christian church. He was. And, yeah. and, and, yeah. and he, and he was uh, anybody who knows the biography of Nero, he was a monster. He was a beast. <laughs> he was a horrible person. And he, uh, uh, you know, he, the the theory is, and I think it's probably roughly correct, that he had orchestrated a, a fire that burned down about a third of the city because he wanted yeah. to rebuild it uh, in his own image and call the whole city Neropolis. He wanted to, you know, change right. it. And uh, when public opinion turned against him, he had to blame someone. And, and apparently Jewish advisors in his administration said, blame the Jew, blame the uh, Christians. You know, right. we don't. And so they became the scapegoats. And that really was the triggering event. That's where this campaign against Christians began in 65 A.D. when when Nero launched the first. This is the first official imperial persecution of Christians up until then, Rome had been more or less kind of favorable toward the Christian movement. It was the Jewish people that were out to get them. But that's when yeah. everything changed, you know. That was the yeah. First- and and you just a moment ago you you made that uh, you distinguish between the two entities we have the great horror the harlot and right. then we have the beast and yeah. uh, and then now we see these two groups that are you know both persecuting christians and it's and um um it's it's also perfect timing in that you you reference the fact that the jewish advisors they kind of forced his hand or prompted yeah. him in some way, right? Uh, yeah. Maybe not forced his hand, but influenced yeah. him. He probably didn't need too much pushing, but <laughs> they influenced him to persecute the Christians. This yeah. is exactly what we see with Christ. Yeah. Uh, they are uh, they're, they are the ones uh, influencing Pilate. They're influencing the Roman uh, yes. empire to, to right. persecute. They're, they're doing the same thing when it comes to Paul. They're, they are pushed. So what we can see in that is a perfect picture of that persecution yeah. coming from the great whore and using yeah. um, the utilities and the resources of the beast yeah. to persecute Christians. Yeah. And there's a uh, interesting in chapter 17, you, you know, what happened is, is Nero started his campaign against Christians, but early on it began morphing into a campaign against Israel. It yeah. was the Jewish re- revolt in 66, and, and so they were kind of fighting on two fronts for a while. But eventually, Christians kind of became, uh, you know, a secondary concern, and Israel became the primary focus, and especially Jerusalem. And the interesting thing is that Revelation 17, the last couple of paragraphs, documents that because it says the beast took up a campaign against Christ and his followers— but that was not successful because he is the king of kings and lord of lords. Right. And then in the last paragraph, you find out that the beast actually launches a campaign against the woman. Right. Earlier, she was sitting on the back looking cozy. I'm I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. Right. She's got all of these uh, boasts she can make because she's being propped up by Rome. But by the end of chapter 17, Rome is actually attacking her. 
right. burned her flesh, eating her, destroying her, and that's exactly what happened. Rome destroyed Jerusalem, yeah. and it all happened in 70 AD. So you have to say it's almost a picture perfect, you know, analysis and description of what actually happened in those several years. Yeah, and just another proof that that the identity of the harlot is Jerusalem is that what takes place in Revelation 17 is actually a prophecy from e the book of Ezekiel. Yes. Um, and and I think it's Ezekiel 36. I can't remember exactly. Um, but uh, there's there's two chapters where this is discussed, um, and it, it, it's a prophecy about Jerusalem that will that will uh, occur, and we see it taking place in Revelation 17 on the harlot. Yeah. And then we have, like you, that Revelation 11 is the clear identification where it's, you know, speaking, it says their dead bodies shall lie. Speaking of the two prophets that are mentioned there in Revelation 11, the dead bodies shall lie in the streets of that great city, uh, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Exactly. Clearly Jerusalem. Yeah. And then we have that great city as uh, itself um, a title that is being used for uh the great whore and the harlot repeatedly. And uh, at the end, Revelation 17 tells us there as the reveal, um, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Clearly, Jerusalem. Yeah. Right. And um, so uh, another uh, thing that's very interesting uh, as well, and I, I knew about this, but I think you emphasized it a little bit more because um, I, I feel like uh, it was a little bit more lucid when I watched one of your teachings in uh, your Revelation series. And that is, um, so we have Nero who reigns. That would be the sixth emperor. He is the one that persecutes the church. R directly following his reign is when we see uh, the beginning of the, the Jewish revolt and the Jewish right. wars, 67 to 70, the exact time period that's mentioned. But what you pointed out was the emperor that follows Nero, he yeah. continues for a short time, just as Revelation 17. Do you mind that, sharing yeah, that? No, that's, that's Galba. And, uh, you know, Nero uh, died. He was forced to commit suicide in 68 in the summer. Uh, he, you know, he made such a mess of things that he was his own, you know, he was, he was basically... Yeah. Uh, uh, and his famous last words were, what an artist the world is losing, you know, so... <laughs> he, he, right, right. He, well, anyway... Uh, I think he was a musician, wasn't he? He was. He, you know, yeah. the, the, the he, old uh, the, adage is he fiddled while... Right. While burning, except the fiddle hadn't been invented yet. Can I ask you that? Yeah. That's so interesting. <laughs> I was wondering, that was a question I wanted to ask you a moment yeah. ago. I was thinking, is that anachronistic when we see that, that famous it portrait? Is. It's an okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, the best evidence is that Nero was out of town when, uh, when Rome okay. burned, uh, but he did appear to orchestrate it. But anyway, yeah. what happens then in 68 is he dies, and then you have the next emperor, a guy named Galba, uh, who only rules for about six months. So he takes us into 69, and, um, and then it's called the year of four emperors because Rome itself had a succession of four emperors, each one killing the last one. So Galba right. goes down. There's, uh, what is it? I, um, uh, blank on his name. Um, anyway, there's four of them. Sorry, I should have gone back and looked at those names again. But it, it, oh, but, no, that's okay. Yeah. Event, uh, uh, four of them. And the one that finally ends that uh, chaotic time is Vespasian, who was actually carrying on the campaign in, in Israel against Jerusalem. But he was so alarmed at the chaos of what was happening in Rome with this succession of emperors that he finally pulled out his best troops and headed for Rome and left his son Titus to mop up the Jerusalem issue. So, so Vespasian goes to Rome, <clears throat> eliminates the instability, becomes the emperor himself, and he rules you know, fairly uh, effectively for uh, 10 years or so. And his son Titus is left, this is interesting, not with the best Roman troops, but a bunch of mercenaries, because <laughs> Vespasian took the best troops with him. And so the guys that are left under Titus' control are not very good at obeying orders, and they're the ones who committed mass destruction in Jerusalem that Titus himself would have strongly opposed. He wanted to keep this, the temple there. He wanted to turn it into a pagan 
uh, center of worship. It was a beautiful place, you know. It was the one of the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, but these guys. Were so, so the human affairs are so interesting in light yeah. of the providence of God. <laughs> you know, that's so. Right. That's so incredible. These guys, they go in, they burn the temple. They're trying to get all the gold out from between the rocks and all of that, you know. So Jesus said not one stone would be left upon another. That's precisely what happened. Uh, and it was really out of Titus's control. He was furious at the fact that the destruction took place that way. But but he did really, he just didn't have the command of these people that he needed. Right, right. Okay, um, so uh, I think we were talking about the the evidences uh, just a moment ago, and um, so we worked our way to the to the kings. We have the sixth king. Uh, the, another proof of that, as you were just now sharing, um, is that we have Galba. Okay, so he he uh, reigned for just a short period of time, just as is predicted um, uh, and described in Revelation seventeen. And then another um, uh, evidence that I've heard for the early date is the fact that uh, the the Jewish population, this would be from sociology, the Jewish population seems stable, right? Uh, maybe maybe uh, not population, you would say, but uh, uh, just the Jews in general, they haven't, it doesn't seem at least, uh, undergone any mass persecution or the diaspora right. hasn't occurred yet um right and at the uh at the time right in, the, yeah the, i mean that at the that, authorship of yeah, uh, changed, when john is pinning it right, yeah right that changed dramatically after 70 but if revelation is written earlier then you wouldn't expect revelation to, to describe right. that. The, the massive uh death Upwards of a million people dying in Jerusalem, another half a million or more being hauled off into slavery. The, the status of Jewish people in 70 AD was there was a breathtaking demotion of yeah. their status and influence and cachet, you might say, in the Roman world after 70 AD. They kind of gradually clawed back, and by the middle of the second century, they sort of reinstated a certain degree of of their uh, influence, but but immediately after Jerusalem fell, uh, the, the Jewish people went through one of the most horrific uh, losses of, of status in the Roman world you could ever imagine. On the other hand, Christian people, you know, to use the old adage, kind of came out smelling like a rose, you know, they, they, uh, they had avoided all of these catastrophes, they came out of hiding, they, a lot of them moved up into Antioch, it, Kind of became the new uh, venue for for uh, Christian people and uh, and and lived there and and uh, it really became a, a period of more or less unprecedented peace for virtually a generation for Christian people from seventy until ninety five. Ninety five was the first little burst of persecution, and that's you know that's what twenty five years or so. That's a fair amount of time. A lot of people lived out the rest of their lives in peace. Uh, the the campaign by Domitian was fairly short-lived. It was uh, took a few months. There's not a documented case of anyone dying in that persecution. There was some you know, brutal treatment of some Christians. but And then there was another period of peace from 95 until about 117 under Trajan. It's still, it once again, is kind of a quiet. In other words, the point is, after 70 AD, yeah. Christians were living in a very different world than they had been before especially right. compared with what happened under Nero. Right, right. Yeah, so um, uh, those would be pretty three pretty powerful evidences when yeah. it comes to the early dates. Uh, right. Internally, I would say, uh, internally, all of the evidence leans on one in one direction. And I would, and per, this is my personal opinion, I feel as if it's overwhelming, especially the references to the temple. I mean, the, the temple is described. We even have the, the prophecy, the same prophecy of the Olivet Discourse uh, in Luke yes. 21 that's mentioned that, um, uh, the, that the court of the temple leave out, right? Like it says in Revelation 11. Right. Um, and it's the same, the same quote that the Gentiles will it will be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles, yeah. uh, and and that's that is what Jesus said was going to take place within that generation. Yes. Um, so I mean, the, the evidence to me is is overwhelming. Um, so that was the next thing I was going to do, and you kind of got into this a little bit earlier. If you could give me, um, I'm curious what what you, what you would use for your scriptural support um, for a partial preterist 
position, generally speaking? Well, um, I would. So, in terms of Olivet discourse, just to give you yeah, material, yeah, if you go back to the Olivet discourse. Uh, you know, the I think it's verse thirty-four of chapter uh, twenty-four of Matthew is where you have that statement: uh, "This generation will not pass away." Some people ask the question, what about the texts that come afterwards? And uh, it does seem to me, now th there's difference of opinion here, and so I'm not, again, trying to be too heavy-handed at this point, but it does seem to me that as you read the rest of chapter 4, but especially chapter 25, uh, you begin to see a more long-range kind of trajectory. The, you know, the, chapter 25 has essentially three little uh, kind of stories or parables. You've got the, the 10 virgins, um, and uh, you know that could arguably be tied still to 70 AD events, although it's not quite as clear, but it certainly could be. Then you get the parable of the talents, and that certainly seems to have a little bit more of a long-term uh, yeah, flavor to it, because we're talking about a guy you know, the king is gone for a long period of time. He leaves in the care of his servants' responsibility to invest and, and be uh, good stewards and so on. That already feels like more of a long-term kind of thing. And then at the end of it, you do have, a, a, you know, the Son of Man coming in the glory with his angels. It, right. Some people and say, and oh, the general judgment. Exactly. And therefore, you must have the general resurrection as well. Exactly. And, and I, I've read people that argue, well, that's still talking 70 A.D. And I say, OK, I, I see you saying that, but I, I have to say yeah. you're straining me a little bit. to, to Yeah, really that's there because the language is so sweeping uh, that it, it's much more, I think, accommodating to a, to a, a fair reading of it to say this is really describing the end of history. This is the final. Right the final disposition of the human race more than kind of a 70 AD event. So it seems to me that even there in Matthew, you begin to see an allowance for more of a long-term uh, picture of things, especially in 25, even though the Olivet Discourse is by its own terms restricted. That kind of thing you can see elsewhere, you know, that sort of thing that there's, there's more of a long-term. I think Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, when he talks about then comes the end. He uses that very powerful language. Right. The kingdom is delivered back to the Father, kind of a mission accomplished mentality. That seems to be more of a, uh, a focus on a long-term project. Yeah. That's conclusion. That kind of thing, I think, still persuades me of, a, of a, what we call partial preterist outlook. Right, yeah, and um, you mentioned earlier that uh, this generation shall not pass till all these things yeah. be fulfilled, and he clearly is speaking at the, uh, in terms of that temple that was there yeah. currently the first in the first century, yeah. and he even says, I believe in Luke, maybe it's even in Matthew's gospel, but in Luke he says, behold, right? So he's, you know, he's he's pointing yeah. to the temple. He's telling them to look, right? You see right. these things, he says, exactly. these things. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. there's no way around it. It's like, the, you know, both of those, both Luke and I think all three synoptics do the same thing where it's uh, the disciples say, look at this, you know, Jesus. So beautiful. Dead. Yeah. Be, your house is left to you desolate. You know, he's mm -hmm. just given chapter 23 of Matthew is this, this huge uh, condemnation of the hypocrisy and so on. And he concludes it, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you, but you, you mm -hmm. would not look. Your house is left to you desolate. The disciples are just astonished. They can't believe what they've heard. As they're leaving the temple, Jesus, or they say to him, look, wait a minute, Master, look at this place. You, uh, did you really mean that? I mean, look at these wonderful right. stones. And Jesus says to them, what? He says, do you see all these stones? Let me tell you something. Not one of these is going to be left one another. It's all going to be thrown down. And that's what precipitates their question. When is this going to be? Right. And right. so the whole Olivet Discourse is really a response to their concern that Jesus has looked at that very temple that they were bragging about and predicted it's going to be laying in ruins, ruins, you know, and, and, the, and then he makes it clear it's all going to happen in the near term. Again, it seems to me just almost inescapable. 
Right, right, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, it has to do with that temple. That temple was destroyed historically, we know, uh, yeah. in that generation. I mean, all those things came to pass, which also fits perfectly. And he and he actually quotes, Christ quotes um, Daniel 9, yeah. the abomination of desolation. Yeah. And if you run those 70 weeks out, that's yeah. the exact it's, point yeah. in time in which yeah. it was destroyed. Christ was cut off in that 62nd week, and then that exact amount of time, 40 years later, the 70th week, that's when the temple was destroyed. Yeah. And that is the, as you mentioned, 25 to 40 years, roughly, you know, that time period is the time period of a generation, which is why Jesus repeatedly warns that generation when they're weeping for him as he carried his cross. He said, don't weep for me, weep for you and your children. Yeah, um, yeah the Jews, they said, his blood be on us yeah. and our children. Uh, and and, was. and I mean, that that statement is has sometimes been used to justify anti-Semitism, which is not legitimate, but it does right. refer to that generation of Jews right. who were unbelieving and were bringing yeah. these catastrophes on themselves. Yeah, right. Who 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 crucified Christ? Yeah, and rejected the Messiah. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, you mentioned earlier, too, how people will try to find uh, a different way to understand uh, the phrase, uh, this generation, um, and that is actually a common phrase that Christ uses himself. Yeah. Each time we yeah. see it come up, it's it's Christ. It's not just even generally the uh, or just the narrator. It's Christ yeah. speaking, yeah. and every time it refers to his generation, you might yeah. say, the yeah. generation that was living at that time, every single and time. And that's the that's the lexicon definition of the word. I mean, that's the yeah. point. You can't you can't take that word and twist it to mean something else, contrary to its standard, um, you know, dictionary meaning. And, and right, the problem with with trying to make it mean something besides what it manifestly does mean. Just by right, death. right, yeah, and and even too, um, Christ said all these things will occur in this generation. The, the argument, I think, Hal Lindsey, uh, you alluded to it earlier, um, he'll say, well, it's the generation that begins to see these things, uh, they won't pass away. All of it will happen within one generation. But the problem with that is it still limits it to Christ's generation because we can, uh, to use your word, manifestly see that he is pointing to that temple. Therefore, right. exactly. it's... It's limited now again, once again, to the temple of the first generation, and that's that that does work just fine then. That's right. That's yeah. right. yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and Daniel's seventieth week, obviously, as I referenced, it it points into that, and people try to put a gap there. Is there yeah. a gap? Uh, well, uh, if someone wants to put a gap there, they can they can try to do that, but there's nothing in the text, right, that would justify a gap. I mean, there's not even a hint. In the not even a hint that that there's anything other than 70 weeks that are going to take place in in consecutive succession and in fact it would rather sabotage the whole sense of what's being said to daniel to just arbitrarily throw in a gap of extended time uh and make the 70th week something way out thousands of years in the future it's it is a it is a desperate attempt to keep a certain theological scheme intact uh, and do some justice to the text, but it's doing no justice to the text. It's it's really, I think, an exercise in dishonesty at best. Yeah, to do that. But it's it's certainly been standard in dispensational circles to say, well, that seventieth week of Daniel, the week of Jacob's trouble, it's still in the future, and it's the mm -hmm. tribulation and all of that. So much hangs on that. I mean, so much. Yeah, of the system hangs on an idea that is utterly indefensible from a standard textual, you know, um, analysis of what it actually says. Yeah, and, and um, you know, the, so if you run those 70, if you just allow, uh, you know, yeah. Daniel, Daniel 9 to just give you the timeline of the 490 years, the 70 weeks, it fits like a glove, it does, right? Yeah. The 62nd week, as I mentioned, Christ is cut off, and in that 70th week, that last week, is when the abomination of desolation occurs. And really, what Christ is doing in Matthew 24, he prophesies when he's telling them about the destruction of the temple, that is what the abomination of desolation is. They ask, when are these things going to be? And he, um, you know, get being a prophet, 
gives them these particular signs that are leading up to it. Right, and in that he proves obviously his divinity. I think uh, Eusebius was the one that used this as an example. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, that there were many that escaped of those that took heed to Christ's words, and um, uh, they ended up living because of that. And, and Eusebius yeah. used this as an example to argue for uh, yeah. Christ's divinity. Yeah, yeah. No, I've read Eusebius, but I hadn't caught that, so that's uh, that's uh, good to know. Go back and take yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, um, the other thing too is um, with Daniel's seventieth week. If we compare it to the other the other visions, all the visions of the Book of Daniel are all, are all pointing towards the coming kingdom, the installation of the of the kingdom, yeah. Uh, yeah. and we see that with the statue um, in Daniel two, yeah. I believe. We yeah. see it uh, in Daniel seven with the beasts, the four yeah. beasts, right. and then we see it uh, given a little bit more. It's kind of the focal point is right there at the end with Rome and the Messiah. It kind of yeah. focuses in at the very end there, those that last time period. But all of it's pointing to and overlapping the same thing. And right. if we look at that again, they all point to Rome. You have um, yeah. Babylon as being the head of gold. He tells him yeah. these are four successive kingdoms yeah. that come. What does that come out to be? The fourth kingdom is Rome. Yeah. And then, yeah, it has to be exactly. And uh, we, you know... We compare it to the four beasts, and those four beasts line up perfectly as well. Yep, absolutely. It, you know, it, it almost becomes um, embarrassingly obvious. It really when, does. When you see it uh, the way you've just described it, and it's interesting to me how, how uh, ferociously people resist it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, I, it's, I, it I, really. I really think, I think, Tyler, part of the reason for that is, if I can be really cynical about it, People who want to argue we're living in the end times uh, can sell books. And it's yeah. easy to publish a book and say, here's the latest sign that proves, you know, that we're within. And I remember, right. you know, I've, I've told the story, maybe I told it when we interviewed earlier, but when I heard Hal Lindsey speak in 1968 uh, to about, about 500 college students of whom I was one and argue that, that in his view, the return of Jesus had to take place by 1975. He just couldn't imagine it would be any later than 1975. And you know, if you get people to believe that, you can get a lot of traction for a little while. You can yeah. sell books. You, can, I, I, you know, Hal Lindsey, I'm sure he meant well and was sincere. But, but the point is, it's very, it's a great seduction. Yeah, we want to believe we're living in the end times, and I I get people sending me emails all the time responding to something I've got online. Well, don't you know that you know the the war that's going on in Israel right now? Doesn't that prove we're living in the end times? And you say, well, no, it really doesn't prove that. You, right. You take this morning's newspaper, and 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 interpret the Bible in light of the newspaper. You can come yeah. up with any fool thing you want but if you right, take right. bible and interpret what's happening you get very different answers and so i think i think we need to stick with the bible and its plain sense and let world events happen as they will but not get swept up into current events that somehow force us to rethink you know what the bible otherwise pretty plainly says right yeah yeah i mean that that's that's what it's meant to be is our rock right it exactly. gives us stability no matter what's going on around us it it is our foundation in it, and in many different ways, right? Even in, in personal hard times, it's our foundation, sure. our rock. But then also in um, uh, tumultuous times in society, we yeah. can go back to that rock and know what's going to happen and have no worries. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so I got two last quick questions. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, and these these should be fairly short and quick. Let me ask you this, uh, Bruce. Uh, what would be the number one best evidence that you would use from the book of Revelation? Just so we kind of um, keep this in line. Uh, the book of Revelation, the best evidence that you would use uh, for a partial preterist position? Well, yeah, I, I, would, I would go to chapter 20 first. Uh, I think that I think people who are full preterists really do wrestle you know they wrestle valiantly i'll give them that 
to try to accommodate a thousand years. And I've seen a variety of ways of trying to do that. But the fact is, when the Bible uses the term a thousand years or a thousand anything, mm-hmm. by and large, that stands for something big. Yeah. You know, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, that just means a lot of hills. There's a lot more than yeah. a thousand hills in the world, but it's not like it's only a thousand. Right. It's just all of them. And um, he'll be faithful to a thousandth generation. That just means a whole lot of generations, you know. Right. I people pull out their slide rules and start calculating when is a thousandth generation. Uh, Jesus rules for, with his people for a thousand years. It's just a way of saying it's an extended period of time. And, and to try to say that then what happens at the end of that thousand years is actually what happened in 70 AD. It just, I, I think. Right. It, you're, you're taking your presupposed outlook and forcing the Bible into a pigeonhole where it will not easily go. And, and I, I think the whole reason we have Revelation 20 is to tell us there's still an unwritten chapter here. There's still something out there in our future that, that is part of the trajectory of history. And as I mentioned earlier, I think another little hint of that, there may be others, but I think those seven thunders in chapter 10. Yeah. Uh, because to say, to see, you know, Daniel was told to seal up the prophecy that had been given him because it was dealing for dealing with things that were in the distant future. For him, the distant future was 500 years in the future. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, at this point, if, if that was to be sealed up, then how much more if the seven thunders were sealed up, it would be extending at least to 500. And I could say a thousand or however long it's going to be. It, it's like it, Revelation is suggesting to us, you don't have all the answers yet. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, what you're getting here is a very good, solid understanding of what happened in the first century and the principles that are applicable at any time in history. But in terms of actually the the sort of uh, uh, ongoing progress of history, there is there's a chapter at the end. We, we don't know yeah. exactly what it's going to look like, but it does seem Revelation is really um, forcing us to take that seriously. So that'd be that'd be where I'd go, I think, if. if someone posed that question to me. Right, right. And then that would be to um, to uh, prove a partial preterist position over exactly. against a full preterist position. Exactly. And um, if I were to ask to show, uh, to demonstrate to someone that's pre-millennial, would you go to the, the shortly come to pass at hand? I would, I would certainly, that would be the first place I'd go. Um, right. Yeah. It was but, interesting. You said earlier uh, that you know, that they take those positions, which I'm aware of this, as uh, somewhat of poetry or, or just a yeah. general uh, idea of uh, yeah. of eminence. And it's 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 so funny um, that um, that sort of hermeneutic of scripture, you know, they would take those that, what are meant to be literal statements as poetic, right. but then yeah. they would attack a partial preterist position. Yeah all throughout the rest of what is apocalyptic literature that is clearly symbolic yeah. and they would they would attack that position as just take it making it out yeah. to be poetry when it's not yeah, yeah. no it is an yeah. irony isn't it because it, uh, it really is yeah I've, I've seen that many times that uh well you can't take that as figurative language though you know it's describing uh in, in you know using first century vocabulary to describe 21st century events that kind of, but but they don't want to apply that rule when it comes to something as straightforward, John yeah. says in the very first chapter, in the prologue, verse, you know, that yeah. these things are just yeah. about to happen, right? And uh, the Greek there is in toxē, uh, in in with rapidity, and that little prepositional phrase, whenever else it's used in the new in the New Testament, I think it's like a half a dozen times or something like that. It manifestly every time is talking about something that's just about to happen. Toxe means rapidly, like right. fast, you know. But in toxe, that prepositional phrase means something that's going to happen in the near term. It's going to happen within, you know, something that's foreseeable from where you are right now. And that's the term, among others, that John uses to describe what he's going to be giving us a revelation. It just seems to me that John himself is pounding that point home seven times. He'll use some form of these things are just about to happen. 
And it seems that if either they were about to happen or John is being really dishonest. All right, uh, Bruce, I really appreciate it again. This was uh, the second time we had you on, and yep. both times were excellent. I got a lot of good feedback the first time, and uh, I'm sure everybody's going to really enjoy this again. So once once more, I am honored to have you on, um, and uh, I appreciate it. And uh, I hope that you, uh, that you have a great rest of your night, and God bless you, sir. Thanks, Tyler. You bet. Yes, sir.